Hey, Hi, everybody. It's Jack Graham along with John Peterson for, I don't know what number we're on, John, but we're over a hundred and something. We talk photos now. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time with any kind of introduction for us because today um, we have a really, really special guest. Um, for those of you who are um, listening to this, it will be available also on our YouTube channel, uh, We Talk Photo, uh, on YouTube, so you can check out the video and and see uh, John and I, we have these domes on hairless <laughs> heads, and, and our guest looks so dapper and fresh. I know it's not feeling that great, we'll get into that, but Andy Mumford is with us. Uh, Andy nope. uh, lives in... in um, in Lisbon, Portugal, but I, I forgot to ask you, Andy, where you were originally from. We'll get into that in a minute, but thank you so much for being here. This is a really great me. honor. I, and I can tell you folks, when we, if we ever do a best of podcast series, which we ought to think about doing, Jeff, um, Andy's going to be in that. Andy's one of my favorite photographers we were just talking about that offline a little bit so without further ado folks andy mumford is with us andy thank you so much for taking some time um uh, those of you who don't know andy i'm going to turn it over to andy for a minute and let him tell you um about himself and where he is coming from and what he does um well i'm a landscape photographer uh and have been professionally for about 15 years uh for me photography all came second out of a love for nature and i think that's probably pretty much true for a lot of people who get interested in landscape photography they're first interested in hiking or camping or just being outside yeah. which is something i've always loved doing from being a kid um and for a long time i had no interest in photography I had no knowledge of photography it just wasn't something that came into my orbit um but at some point when i was in my 30s i kind of started to come across images online of places where i was out hiking and i'd see these photographs that just looked amazing uh and thinking you know i'm, I'm out hiking there seeing these seeing these same places but the, you know I, I should be doing something like this i should be taking pictures like this so i kind of started trying to to teach myself photography and to, and to learn how to do that and um that's kind of where it started and then i think like what happens with most people, it became very quickly an obsession of, of you know, taking better <laughs> photographs and getting better and getting better at it. So, um, yeah, that's 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 where it came, where it started. And what's strange for me is that I don't really draw that much of a line between where I was then and where I was now. It's just I'm a little bit further along that journey of of learning and getting better, but uh, still a lot, a long way to go. And um I think fundamentally, one of the things that I I strive for is that, and what I've realized is that when you're out, you're not really taking photographs of places. You're you're trying to take photographs of the way those places make you feel, much yes. more than actually recording a place. So that for me is is the the philosophy and the goal. It's like, what am I feeling? How do I how do I capture that in a you know in a, in a rectangle, in a two dimensional rectangle. I did tell you, I did warn you that I would ramble. I do ramble. Yeah. But, you know, Andy, I love that. I love that. Um, the point that you made, which is, which is we're trying to capture our reaction or our interpretation of a landscape. And I think that's really what, what artistry is in many ways. Mm -hmm. Artistry art, you know, if you look at the, up the definition of art, it's, it's uh, it involves a lot of the artist's input into it. It's not just recording a pretty picture of a pretty scene or technically competent picture of a pretty scene. It's it's the artist infusing some of themselves into this in, into this work of art. And to your point, it's it's reading your reactions and then trying to capture those reactions on the sensor. Yeah, and I and I think this is where we we can get very easily hung up with with photography because it's it's fundamentally at its base it's a, it's a technical thing you know we're using a, yeah. we're using a mechanical object uh, or an electronic object um, which has 
you know controls which we which we manage which makes it feel like a you know a, a technical thing whereas once you've mastered those technical aspects and i think nowadays with modern digital cameras particularly with mirrorless cameras that's become much much easier because you've got that live feedback of exposure and autofocus is so good now and, and cameras are very forgiving in terms of iso etc um that kind of gets out of gets that out of the way to help you focus on the those aspects of of composition and mood and you know we were talking earlier about about it not being a particularly you know not being a gearhead because for me i actually want the camera to be to disappear i want it to be invisible i want it to what what you're trying to do is get what you see in front of you and what you see in your brain onto onto the onto the onto the memory card um and the more the camera gets into that in the way of that you know working out what what the camera's trying to do playing around in menus playing around with settings then the, the the bigger that gap is, I think, between what you're seeing in front of you and, and, and the emotions that you're feeling. So you, you really ideally want cameras to be almost invisible and so, or as completely intuitive as possible as to be invisible. 100%, 100% because if you're working your left brain trying to figure out the technology, you can't engage the other side of your brain to focus on the creative aspects of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. to totally agree. And it's, it's, um, uh, I don't know quite how to say it, but you know, I see I see so many people that are stuck. I mean, it's kind of fun having a toy, right? It's fun having technology in a way. We're so programmed to to have this technology that a lot of people just sort of stay with technology and don't want to move past it to just mm -hmm. turn it into a tool. You, you know, it's funny. We were uh, John and I just finished a uh, couple of workshops, one of which was. Um, in, in the Southwest in the four corners area. And, you know, it was very, John, you know, you probably remember there were a number of our participants had very heavy camera bags mm -hmm. and they were loaded down with, you know, like five, six different lenses and all sorts of stuff. I mean, they were heavy enough that I don't know that I'd want to even pick them up out of the vehicle to hand them to them, which we did. And I, I didn't watch you, John, too much, what you were using, but I, I basically used, uh, you know, uh, one lens, the, the almost the whole. <laughs> Pretty much other, the whole time. A couple of times we put a long lens on, but I used one lens for a number of days. And, you know, again, it's the <clears throat> people, you can't get wrapped up in that stuff. And I look at Andy's work and I look at the simplicity and the impactfulness of it. And, you know, Andy, you know, you obviously have some kind of a bag that you carry your gear in. Um, what, what, what's in that bag for, for example, on the trip you're going to take to Norway in, in, uh, in January and February, what, what, what will you take? I mean, I, I have to be honest, everything changes really depending on the trip. I don't Correct. think there's one set of gear that's good for everything. Correct. But something, if I'm going to Norway, if I'm going to the north, then uh, I, I know from experience, there's a lot of wide angle places there because you're often down at the coast shooting on the coastline. So it's kind of wide angle shots. Um, I'm always going to have on every trip an ultra wide zoom and a, and a telephoto zoom. And those are the two the two lenses that I will use it everywhere. The ratio of that really depends. Norway is a little bit more wide angle heavy. If you go somewhere like, like the Dolomites, that's much more telephoto heavy, but those two lenses will always be in my bag. For Norway, then there's probably also gonna be a fast wide for the Aurora. So like an F2.8 or an F1.4, something like 13 millimeter or, or on full frame, something you know, like 20, 21 millimeter, something like that for, for Aurora. Um, and that's that would be primarily what I would use most of the time. I didn't used to use mid-range zooms at all. Um, I tend to use them more now because I, I've got you know a really nice sixteen to eighty, which is a what's that a twenty-four to one twenty equivalent that weighs nothing. Mm -hmm. It tends to go in the bag, and that's just a nice video lens for doing B-roll or if I need to record some some myself while I'm there. But primarily, every every camera kit that I've ever had has resolved, revolved around the the wide angle zoom, so the the fifteen to thirty five, or the seventeen to thirty five, or the you know APS C, 
10 to 10 to um 10 to 24 or on the gfx it's for 20 to 35 and then a tele and then a tele zoom and those two will be res- probably account for about 95 90 percent of my shots yeah yeah uh, the point is, is that you don't carry a lot of gear, and most of the people no. who do what we do, we we don't care. Our, you know, the, the our clients carry so much gear, and I, you know, I mean, it's it's not. I don't think it's necessary. Um, let, let's talk about uh, what <laughs> your your schedule, Andy. I know we've been trying to get our podcast recorded here for a while, and you've been gone, and we've been gone. Uh, where have you been and where are you going? Um, well, yeah, I do quite a lot of workshops. I'm traveling about three or four months a year. Uh, where have I been? Uh, the last one was in the Dolomites, which is a, pretty much a staple. I think I've been there more than any anywhere else. It's the most, the workshop that I've done more than any, any other workshop. And I, it's, I, I love it because it's mountains, lakes. It's just beautiful. But also this year I've been in Namibia, Iceland, Greenland, um, where else? Uh, Norway. Uh, and I think yeah, that was probably it for the year. Next year, there'll be Patagonia coming up. There's going to be the USA. There's going to be... Um, and then you know what it's like with workshops. You're usually doing everything about eight, 18 months out in advance. So right now, yeah, right. this week, I'm putting things together for um, for 2020. Five, which seems ridiculous, but you know we're looking at Japan, and I, I, I'm I'm at a point now where I I'm kind of really fascinated and just trying to find go a little bit out of the normal uh, what do you call it the, no, the, the normal circuit. Yeah, uh, without I think you know when when I started you, you you have locations that are really beautiful places like Tuscany and Lofoten and the Dolomites. They're incredible. They're beautiful, and everyone should visit them. But um, you're getting. I've crowded. been to a lot of those places <laughs> now. So then, they, they do become more and more popular. And then there's the, the fact that I, you you reach a point where I think people have done workshops with you before, so they have a little bit of trust in you. So you can take a few more risks and say, well, you know, have you ever thought about going here? Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of looking at stuff like that in like in the northern parts of Namibia. We were even talking about Angola the other day, Ecuador. I've got a, one of my partners works in Ecuador. Things in Peru, doing mountains in Peru, things like that for, for 2025 and just really trying to do something a little bit different and a little bit outside of the uh, outside of the norm. And that's it's an exciting thing for me because I, I get excited by making plans to visit new places and seeing new places. Um, I think you're, you, there's a possibility that you're a less effective workshop guide. You know, if I like the places like the Dolomites, I know it so well that I'm very confident in whatever the weather's doing, you can help people find compositions and things like yep. that. Whereas when you're in a place that you don't know as well, you're, you, you're solving problems yourself a lot more going, okay, what's happening here? How are we going to deal with this? What's the light going to do? Um, which I think, yeah, does, does take a little bit away from the, the capacity to, to help people with their own compositions. But at the same time, I think it's it's quite interesting that that problem solving part of it of, of, of and then trying to communicate, okay, this is what I'm thinking. This is, these are the problems that, that I'm seeing and uh, this is how I think we can try to solve it. But um, yeah, rambling again. No, 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 but you, 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 you know, you like to go where you know, but it's also good to find some new, <clears throat> some new ground, um, you know, for your, 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 your clients that know you, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I looked at all your stuff. Now what's going to happen is people are going to see this um, podcast and they're going to want to go on a workshop with you. And man, you, you're, you're sold out. You're, you're, you're booked. Right. Yeah. I don't know. And I, there's that's, a reason for that. Thing, by the way. That's a, that's post post COVID things changed. Um, I, I, I feel very lucky to be in that situation that things are booking up. I I don't know if it will always be the case, but yeah, right now things tend to tend to book quite quite far in advance. But it feels like we came out of COVID and everybody wanted to travel again. Um, so it's it's been um it's been weird, you know, having this situation now where everything is we're thinking of like things a year, two years in advance, and making plans that far ahead because you know twenty twenty four is is mostly it's pretty much everything sold out touch wood that's a good thing yeah 
That's hey, a good Andy, point. let me let me switch gears a little bit because there was something you said in the introduction that really uh, it really kind of struck me as as interesting um, it, or it made me think a little bit. You were you you touched a little bit on your photographic journey and how you're still learning, and the the thought that popped into my head was that the more we know sometimes the less we know you know the, the more experience i have the farther along the journey i realize i don't know as much as i or there's still so much more to learn i think is a more positive way to put that there's um that uh i can't remember what the theory is but it's a theory on knowledge and knowledge acquisition about you know what you know and what you know you don't know and what you don't know you don't know um, so the more you learn about anything, the much more you're aware of how much it is that you don't know. Whereas when you, you don't know it, like, so I, I have very little knowledge of, I don't know, let's, uh, speaking, I'm not going to say a language because I, I speak a few, uh, but let's say music. We were talking about music earlier on. I've never really tried to play a musical instrument. So there's a logical part of me that knows that it's challenging to learn how to play a guitar. But because I've never tried, I have no perception of how difficult it is. And that you can probably reach some point where you can pick out a tune or strum a few chords and it sounds acceptable. Uh, but when you reach that point, you're going to have this massive knowledge of all of the stuff, you know, and the, of the incredibly talented guitar players and how good they actually are. Because I probably can't appreciate incredibly talented musicians because i have no you know i have no experience of trying to do it so yeah the more i learn about photography the more i'm very aware of of what i don't know i'm very i don't know if this is true of everyone but i think it's true a lot of a lot of people um you can either be satisfied with your work uh or you can be unsatisfied with your work really and if you're unsatisfied with your work, you're probably always going to try to make it better. If you're satisfied with your work, you're probably not. Um, and I'm constantly dissatisfied <laughs> with my work. I'm constantly thinking, oh, I could have done better here. Or it's very rare that I, you know, I, I take an image and think, bang, nailed it. Awesome. You know, I, I just, I don't think in that way. There's always a part of me thinking, mm, yeah, I could have probably done better there. Um, and then I'll see, you know, you, when you're doing workshops and you'll see someone else has shot something, you'll be like, oh, I didn't see that. That's brilliant. Why didn't I see that? And that's always there. And and for a long time, um, that used to bother me. And I used to be not so much crippled by it, but it would be something that I would see as a problem. And it's only as I've become, um, I don't know if it's older or just better at photography or more comfortable that I've started to see that actually as a positive that, you know, being a little bit dissatisfied with your work um, is the prime motivator to push yourself to get better, to yeah. learn new things. But, you know, that comes with the, with the, um, with the knowledge that, you know, you're always going to be a little bit frustrated. And when I, I think when you read biographies of, of artists, whether they be, photographers or painters or musicians or even people who are operating at the elite level of sport i think you often see that drive in people of to be better because they're very very perfectionist uh, i remember reading the biography of a, of a really uh, i i'm from the uk and i grew up playing rugby and it's a sport that i enjoy and i know it means nothing to anyone in the united states but it was a guy who made a you know he's an incredibly successful and made his career playing at the at the highest level representing his country and said that he didn't really enjoy that much of his career because he was always frustrated with not being good enough and well i think that's quite extreme um but i i don't think that's or or kind of a, a little bit of that is something that we find in in a lot of people who are um doing so you know who from the outside are, seem to be doing something quite well but when you you know when you get into that people can be very critical and i know i'm very very critical of my own work and really do feel that i'm got a lot 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 more to learn oh, exactly. I, I think I, I, if, I, I, if you if you talk to john if you talk to you know and we've done them here you could pull out the podcasts with guys like guy tal and michael gordon and and uh cole thompson and all the mm -hmm. great photographers i guarantee you they've all said the same thing either on the podcast or to us privately 
Um, and it, we're, we're, you're just, you're never satisfied to a point. Mm-hmm. And if you try to get to you, it can drive you nuts. Oh, you um, can. I, I, I think that there's a nuance with that too, though, around, you know, being satisfied with your work and having a, a deep desire to even get better, to get even more satisfaction mm-hmm. instead of being dissatisfied. Cause the thing that, the thing that, gets me sometimes is is there's a fine line you know we do a lot of self-critique of our own work right that's how we get better we said oh, I, you know mm-hmm. i don't like this i could do this better um and and a lot of people will take self-critique and beat themselves up with it instead of just using it as a learning tool so you know mm-hmm. like for me i'm happy to be i'm satisfied and i know i can get better and I use my self critique as a learning opportunity instead of a, a self flagellation device to beat myself up with. Um, <laughs> yes, we're going to keep this PG, Jack. So don't worry. No, I'm, I'm just <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I I do that, and it's because of my background in music. Yeah, and I got I, I Andy. I always tell my participants. I said, "You want to learn how to do something hard? Go learn how to play the piano really good. Take it a photograph." isn't that hard mm-hmm. it, it's difficult to do it consistently good like anything else in art but i gotta tell you there's i mean le- learn how to learn how to play an instrument at the highest level man that's mm-hmm. tough that is tough and i and because of that you know i don't i, I did that for a lot of years and <laughs> people that know me will t- oh, tell me you know i i am so you know, I walk. I I look at images that when I come home from somewhere, and I I I literally will look at them and walk away. I, I I get I get angry. I go, well, you know, why? How come I did that? What what did I? What was I doing? You know, and and I and I kind of have to pull myself out of that, and you know, smile. And, I think you know if. It's the balance. So you've always got this. Is I think what what John said. It's it's finding that balance, which is so easy to say. But, it, it is but so so hard hard to do. I th- I mean for me, what I was saying earlier, and this is what I generally tend to come back to, is that I came first from loving being out in nature and and walking. And if someone said to me, "You can only hike or take photographs," you can't do both it would always be hiking because just that, that for me is the primary experience and photography always comes out of that experience. Correct. So what I always try to come back to when I feel like that is the fact that I love being out there anyway, and that I went there because of photography. So if you get up and you, you know, you haul yourself up a mountain and it's and you, you're at four o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you shoot and you think it's going really well. And then you come back and you look at what you've done. You go, oh, this is all rubbish, all rubbish you still went there and you still had that experience and you might not have captured it. And these are the things that I always circle back to um, is that I really do because of photography, I've been in some amazing places, seen some amazing things that I wouldn't have done if I hadn't been there with a camera and that, that I can, you know, that, that can, that adds richness to my life. And it adds, you know, these are experiences that, that I will carry with me forever. And while, I would love to have been able to capture it. And the journey is to get better and better at doing that. But I was still there. And I think that's the most important thing. And that's what I try to remind myself in that kind of thing is that, you know, when I'm feeling really frustrated with not having succeeded in, in getting the image that I, you know, that I had here, but I, at least I, you know, I was there and what, a, what, a, what an amazing morning. Um, yeah, and, even if, and, and, even when the weather's crap, you know, you have terrible weather and it's raining, you enriched your life by being out in nature. And, yeah, and, never... and that's another thing that's constant with really great photographers. And, and John will attest, everybody we've had on here that mm-hmm. has some kind of, uh, you know, portfolio that is way above average, whether they're professionals or they're, you know, non non-prof- I hate that term professional anymore. It's kind of a dumb term, but, you know, that's kind of constant with all of us. It's, it's the, it's the, uh, experience and and the pictures are really byproducts of that we keep saying that as well you know and mm-hmm. um can we 
Andy, let's just talk about, uh, you have a style of photography. Are you aware of that? No. <laughs> no, People I didn't. That, I really know. And that's always that. the answer, too. But, yeah. you know, to, when you go to Namibia and you go to Norway and you go wherever you go, I think you have a kind of a, uh, a, a style, uh, and, and I'm probably not describing it right, John, so help me with this. It's so strong and so simple. Okay. Well, thank you. Know, you. There's not a lot going on in your images that detract from, I think, what you're trying to say in them. Thank you. Um, I don't, I get, the thing with style is that I do really struggle with it because I don't really know what my style is in terms of the way that I shoot and even in, in the way that I process. Because I, I could name you 20 photographers now who you look at their portfolio and there's a consistent feel across their images, no matter where they're shooting. And I could immediately go, yes, you know, that's, you know, this guy shot that, this guy shot that. Um and I've never really felt that about my own work because sometimes I really like subdued colors and sometimes I really like colors to pop. And then sometimes it's like really wide, big, big landscapes. And then sometimes it's much. So I've really, I really kind of struggle. And I always think that I'm a bit of a magpie because I'm very, you know, I see stuff that people are doing. Oh, that's good. I, I'm going to try doing something like that. Um, so I don't know. I, I really don't know. But what I, what I do feel is that, um, I think there are things that, and you you know because you you know you run workshops. There's 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 understanding something intuitively, which is one thing, um, and then that only becomes problematic when you try to explain that to someone. So if you can say yes, this this photograph works because of this, and this photograph works, you just feel it works. It just has a harmony or a balance in the same way that a, a melody of you know works. And then when you, you try to explain that to someone, if you try to explain to someone why a melody sounds nice, why it's a lovely harmony, you can't. Your language doesn't work there. We don't have the language to, to describe that. And then you're, you're, you realize that you're trying to um, explain something that you feel on an intuit, you know, on a subconscious or you, you, you intuit it. So I, I find asking these questions really because uh, I'm a bit of a nerd. These, these things kind of fascinate me. Why? What is it that? Why are we attracted to certain scenes and certain mm -hmm. I love that. certain elements? So I'm in terms of my own work. I'm I I do believe that I like things simpler. I think um, things that are clean. I don't like visual complexity i don't like um i don't like things that, that don't feel harmonious to me so i'm always generally looking at things in the frame and thinking can i take this out can i remove this what's what's this adding so you, i'm often finding that I'm, I'm removing stuff um that's one of the biggest aspects of my composition is like what can i what can i take out so i i mean i guess that that would be part of a style but beyond that you know i i, I think it's fascinating to ask these questions about why you know if you if you ask a child to draw a mountain even a child that lives in the mountains they, they're going to draw a triangle shape um and that kind of fascinates me because mountains don't look like that or very rarely look like triangles so it's like an it, uh, there's this kind of thing that we have on a subconscious level where we reduce a mountain to its you know its simplest purest form which is a triangle shape um, and I think that there's a part of our brains that works in that way, where we like things to be reduced to their simplest, cleanest form. It's almost as though we're, we we expect the world to look to appear that way. Sorry, sorry. Well, well no, I, I was going to kind of go off on what you're saying. I think you're 100% right that, our, that we're wired and programmed to do that because it helps us simplify the world around us so we can move mm -hmm. more efficiently and effectively through mm -hmm. the world without having to process just amazing amounts of visual information to make sense of our world. So mm -hmm. I think we try to distill stuff subconsciously into, into very simple concepts and forms. We like to put things in buckets because uh, it helps mm -hmm. us navigate. And, no, I think you nailed it there, Andy. No, no, and I think 
you know, I find it told, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but someone did explain to me pretty much what you've just said, that our brain doesn't like complexity because it's more processing power. And we're essentially, our brains are essentially lazy. So the yeah. less processing power we have to do to organize things, you know, we have yeah. to use, then the, the more things are appealing to us. Yeah, and because I was going to say that that that's part of what I what I try to teach as well is is this concept of simplicity and the more that you ask anybody, even your future self, whoever views your images, the more they have to process and compute, the more work it is for them, and sometimes mm -hmm. that's not a good thing. And so, to your point of simplification uh, in photographs, I, I love that. You know, it's it's what can I take out? I love that concept. There's yeah, there's this idea. You know that I, I read a quote somewhere. I think it was in a Joe Cornish book. Um, that subtraction is the most essential form of composition. Subtraction in life and in photography. That you know, is you 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 take out whatever's unnecessary until you've only got what's essential. Because if it's not necessary, then it becomes a distraction. Yes. Um, so if it's and if it's distracting you, it's weak, it's weakening the image or it's weakening the experience. So it's that you know what what can you reduce it down to? So I, there is, you know, an element of that something that I'm aware of compositionally when I'm shooting. But I'm also you know I am a sucker for big wide angle landscapes and stuff <laughs> like that. I do. Yeah, like but you that. can do that and and you keep it simple. You know, back, a long time ago, I'm not doing it anymore. I think if I did it now, I don't know that I think enough of the people who know me think I'm um half crazy anyhow but I used to start my photo workshops the first uh, night before we even did an introduction of who's there and I make everybody listen to the first three to five minutes of Miles Davis's recording of um Basin Street Blues which was done about 1960 and they go why why are you listening to this and then when I explained it we listened to it again and what made that particular tune and many of many other uh, recordings from him and other people impactful is not what he played not the notes it was the space in between the notes mm -hmm. what wasn't there <laughs> was what made it happening mm -hmm. you know and and, and it's sense. a way to explain to people what we're they're going to hear kind of for the next you know three and a half days from me and and uh, maybe I should start doing it. I don't know, but it, it, it's kind of like sometimes what's not there is what is what makes the the photograph really, really, really strong. And uh, uh, I, I, that's another another consistency that John and I hear uh, from people like you and other great photographers we've met and had here. You know, we all kind of do at least try to do the same thing, and we, you know, I'm I don't always do it, I try, but I'm still trying to figure this out. But, um, no, it, it's it's some really, really strong, strong work. Uh, I think, and and for the people who um are listening to this and may not have um uh, YouTube, uh, Andy's website is andymumford.com and that's M-U-M-F-O-R-D andymumford.com please have a look at it and you'll see what we're talking about here um, switch gears a little bit here um, we're, we're getting kind of almost to the end um, Andy you um, in a couple of your videos talk about um your processing mm -hmm. and, uh and your use of the new luminar neo program which i have and i'm looking at and finding it interesting mm -hmm. i was actually a beta tester of the luminar when it first came out probably i don't know seven or eight years ago now maybe longer and then i kind of got away from it um but I think this new program is quite interesting. Could you just talk about that for a minute since you're. I don't know. I, 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 it's, it's the similar thing with, with capture. One. What happens with me is like, I'll, I'll try something, play around with it. And it'll be interesting, but then I kind of always end up going back to Lightroom. Um, so Luminar, it, it had some interesting, some really interesting features. And I think, 
I can't remember off the top of my head. There's like a beautiful thing for for refilling the foreground and stuff like this. But in the end, I tend to always kind of circle back to 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 Lightroom because I just find it very very intuitive. I think when it comes to editing images, well, when it comes to two images, one of the things that I think they really need to have to have some impact is some form of depth. Now, depth can come from all kinds of different. Uh, can be all kinds of different ways, whether it's, you know, you've got that contrast of light or, you know, like the, a wide angle where you've got leading lines and stuff like that. But there, there has to be something that give, stops the, an image feeling static and flat. It has to have some dynamism in it. And that dynamism can come through the flow of, of the way the objects flow together. Uh, it can come from the the, the contrast or the, or the color, um, the way that colors work together. And I think what I'm often trying to do in processing is bring that depth out a little bit. And um, so you're always kind of looking for tools that, that do that, that give image some depth. And one of the things that I use, that I use a lot is uh, Tony Kuiper's luminosity masks, because simply because he was the first, the, the first kind of, technique that I saw that could really allow you to target midtones, that you could really just dive into the midtones of an image and just make it pop. Um, and even now in Lightroom, there's not really a tool for doing that. You the can play around with the shadows and the, and, 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 the, and the highlights and the darks and the blacks, and you've got the curve. But if you just want to do stuff, just working on the midtones, that middle 50%, and just punch that, you, you can't really, it's very hard to do that in Lightroom. Um, and what you see is that there are tools, and I think that's what Luminar does. Luminar's got a few tools that really kind of target that area, and they've got different names them or whatever, but they will just give it that kind of mid-tone punch. So so areas that are a little bit flat because they're not at either end of the histogram will just kind of pop out a little bit. Yeah, there's um, something in there that allows you to adjust the co mid-tone contrast only, which is quite yeah. interesting. Yeah, because it, it really makes a difference. It's not something that, you know... I, I think like a lot of processing is each thing that you do should be almost invisible. You only kind yes. of see it when it's lighted up and you, you get the whole. And I will freely admit that with my own processing, I regularly will pro and just make these little steps that I think are subconscious, you know, that I think are small. And then you look back and you're like, oh, like you go and make yourself a cup of coffee. <laughs> and you come back and you look and you're like, oh my God, what have I done? That's so good. I didn't share yeah. post that or anything. And that happens to me a lot. And I think, you know, most people kind of know that feeling. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it has to be small adjustments, things like that. So Luminar, I used it. I made the video about it. I thought it was fun, but, and it does have quite a good, um, what they do have is a nice focus stacking module, which is good if you're using uh, something like the GFX, because that's a, a camera that I regularly have to focus yeah. stack with. Yeah. But other than that, no, the vast majority of my processing is, is done in Lightroom. Yeah, and then I noticed you're using these case filters am i correct yes yeah i just started using those about three or four months ago and i'm blown away by the how it the simplicity and to change and to add an nd when you need it and they're quite they're quite good in terms of uh you know performance that there's still i don't mm -hmm. see any color and this is not this is no uh commercial i don't have any affiliation with them at all and i i just think they make a great product i yeah i i do use i think when i first started <clears throat> with photography i used to use a lot of graduated uh neutral density filters and i used um lee but over time they were they almost became a crutch i had to use them in every kind of shot this is a long time ago and it was a big step for me to just kind of step away from using those filters and it was you know, camera technology has got better and better and dynamic range has improved. Exactly. I don't even care. The ability to just, you know, bracket, uh, blend images together in Lightroom yeah. with one click. So you've got this massive. So they became something that was utterly redundant. And now I think, you know, they're just something left over from, from film days. They're, they're, they have no real, I right. don't think they have as much necessity, much use for them. Although I do understand that people do still enjoy using them because photography is, is very much a process related thing. And if that's part of people's process and they enjoy using them for that, then I, I think that's great. But from a purely practical point of view, 
I, I don't really see a, a value in them anymore. And also my style of photography changed. So I was doing fewer and fewer long. So I used to use long exposures almost like as a crutch. And I still see this a little bit. People go, oh, there's not really anything here. Maybe if I make it a long exposure, it'll give it some dynamism. And you see that. I think you right. see that with people who are still starting. And I I was very much um, guilty of, of doing that for quite a while. It was like, well, maybe if I blur the clouds, it'll look better. But I don't do that many long exposures anymore. Um, so I use filters less and less and less. So I want them to be as kind of light and insignificant in my bag as possible. So that's why the, the case filters are great. Exactly. The other yeah. thing is, is that, you know, if you're using circular filters and you're working a lot in the snow and in cold places, like trying to screw on, on filters on and on off mm -hmm. is just such a pain. So the magnetic thing is just brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. Yeah. John, what do you think? Any uh, last ideas or anything we want? No, I just I'm just still tickled that uh, Andy that you talked about mid tone punch and contrast, <laughs> but, you know, because that's very, <laughs> that's I know it's a stupid little thing, but very few people talk about it. We talk about highlights and shadows a lot, but I tell you, going into the mid tones with Tony Kuiper's tools and punching oh, yeah. up the mid tones just a little bit, I do that on almost every single image. To you help know, bring know. some energy into one that other thing range. in that vein that I do. I love it, especially when you're using a, a, a longer lens. You know, the the longer, the physically longer the lens, that the inability to get the background sharp as possible is, unless you stack a couple, um, stack a couple images where you you know do different focal points. Um, you know, I, I, I'm trying now to get my backgrounds when I want them, and that's probably more than not, to be sharp. Um, you know, I like the the background, if there's a mountain in the background, I like that mountain to be uh, sharp if possible. And, you know, there are some tools that will help you do that as well. So I think, you know, the midtones and, and the sharpness of the background um, – is is to me is very important has a lot to do with mm -hmm. death andy i got i got one more question for you are you a planning photographer or a reactive photographer do you go out with a specific idea or do you just go out to see what's going to happen um well i, I mean you have to have a bit of both because you, yeah. you go this is a fantastic this is not a quick question <laughs> um I I told you before before we started recording I'm heading to to the southwest um in a couple of weeks. I've never been there but I've wanted to go forever. So I have seen and have a massive uh library and document of locations and spots that I'm really really excited to see. You can't go to anywhere without bringing some level of expectation with you. You know you've always got that there are very few places that you go to that you've not, for me, I've, you know, I've kind of planned, I'm, I'm going to a place where I've planned to be there um, because it looked good and I've done some research. I mean, occasionally there'll be, you know, you'll be driving along and there'll be amazing light about, oh, that looks, looks really good. Or you'll see something that looks interesting and be very reactive. But I would say that's the minority. The majority of places, it's places where I'm going somewhere with some idea and expectation of, of what it is I'm going to see. So when you've got that expectation, it's really kind of hard because you have this idea of what it's going to be like, and you've almost got almost got an idea of, of kind of how you're going to shoot it. Uh, and of course, it's never like you imagine it's going to be. What you the reality never fits with with what you expect. It's yeah. always different in some way um, because, of course, you've only seen photographs and they're two dimensional, and you're you're, you're not getting. So there has to be that time taken to kind of really let yourself familiarize with the place and let let it let you kind of, and that's almost a way of, you need to not so much flush out all those expectations, but just try to get past them because they can stop you from seeing a place. They can, you know, you can be so kind of tuned into, I saw this place and it looked like this, so I, I want to do this. And I, I, I've i seen that in people on, on workshops when they come and they've, they've got a fixed idea of what it's going to be like, and then it's not like that. And then they're disappointed. Right. And so there is that idea of then trying to get past all these expectations that you have um, and and shoot what's there and react. So what I guess what I'm saying to, you know, 
to answer the questions because you talked about being you know planning or reactive is that i do plan significantly but every plan that you make is always going to be um has to is going to be what's the word not not useless but has to be robust enough to to cope with actual reality of the fact that the weather's probably not going to do exactly what you want it to do you want the nice clouds there but they're not there they're over there um and that the foreground doesn't look right and stuff like that so there's always going to be that incredibly reactive thing of like okay now i have to to work out how best to shoot this because it's not really what i what i thought it was going to be so i think that there's it's mostly reactive it's planning in terms of, of finding of, of heading to locations and, and looking at weather and thinking okay the weather looks good the, the condition you know, this, this place looks like it's going to work but then really trying to be as open to the place as possible and and sit down and and see what the place is telling you or walk around because you know if you if you just it's one of the worst things that i think um is that you can get to a place and set up your tripod because i think psychologically once we've set up the tripod we stop you're committed moving. you're committed yeah, to you stop moving yep. so it's like you don't put the tripod up until you're absolutely sure that you're going to shoot just walking around and I, I tend to compose a lot with just with my phone now i don't even take the camera out quite often yeah i use the i use the phone and just zoom in and stuff like that and just walk as much as i can until I feel that I I know the place and that I, I'm you know and I'm, and I I can react and, and respond to it better. But yeah, there's, there's well, it kind of reminds me of the old joke. You know, I, I won't try to tell the joke, but you know, a tripod has legs, but it doesn't walk. The minute mm, you put it down, okay. it's static. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. true. And we tend to you know we, we very once once you set tripods up. It's like we're like, yeah, I might move like a few feet that way or a few feet that way, but not really much. I'm not going to walk over the yeah. other side of that rock. Or, or even, uh, even the height really of big. a tripod, once you set initially set the initial height of a tripod, very rarely mm -hmm. does it move it will, mm -hmm. when you watch people. It's pretty funny. Yep. Absolutely funny. Well, it's, it's you know, the the one thing, thank you for that, Andy. The one the one thing I really love that you said that that resonated with me, of course, is there was a line where you said, uh, listen to what the location is telling you. Yes. And man, you know, the only way to, to hear that is to slow down and to open yourself up. And, and that's, that's the key to, to really kind of, in my opinion, interpreting locations. Yeah. Just remember if, you know, take a photograph, you had a good day, you're out, you know? Yeah. I think, you know, there's photography, my favorite images, and I think the best images come out of an experience that you have. Exactly. And you, you guys know you live in a place that's got, you know, certainly in the Southwest, some really, really popular spots where, and, you know, I can think of places on workshops that are like that, where you go there and you'll be, a, there'll be a lot of people there and most people are doing the same shot. Uh, and the reason is that those are usually incredibly beautiful places where everything works, you know, the, the composition works, but you don't really have to work that much for it because it's kind of obvious. You'll have seen the plate, you'll have seen it shot before and everyone's doing a similar thing. So you'll kind of go there and you'll do, and you'll come away with, you know, a guaranteed, well-composed, really nice shot. Um, but I don't really feel that the experience that you get from that is the same as when you go somewhere and you, you, you explore and you look around and you let it speak to you and you let the place sink in and then you make something because that's what you see and that's what you feel. And those I find for me are the images that years later are the ones that I'm happier with and that, that sit with me that, that I, you know, and from a, you know, they might not be as successful from a commercial point of view. You might not sell as many prints of that. They might, you know, whatever. Amen. But in terms of the, the genuine satisfaction with with your work, those are the ones that that that, that sit with you. Not totally agree. That, yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, totally yeah. agree. It's that artistic satisfaction that we get from seeing and creating versus mm -hmm. place your tripod here and in, in the thousand other holes that have been in this one spot. Oh yeah, no, I'm totally get it, man. Thank you for that. Totally agree. Wow, I can't believe how fast the time went. So, John, <laughs> let's make a note that we get when Andy gets back from one of these, you know, maybe in a month or two before you head on over to uh, 
or head on up to the uh, the Arctic Circle again, or above the Arctic Circle, as you will be. Um, maybe we could get you back on and get a couple, maybe a guy on or Cole or somebody else and get a nice little round table here and we can come up with a topic. Yeah. I'm around from yeah most of December, uh, most of January. I'll, I'll be around. Yeah, great. Well, listen, um, we're going to bang things up and uh, say thank you to Andy. Andy, when we uh, when we uh, knock this thing off, hang hang in for a minute. Excuse me, but um, everybody, thank you all for listening. I hope you got a lot out of this. I, I know I did, and John did. did. We learn a lot from when we do these uh, podcasts as well. It's a great learning tool. Um, any comments, questions, go to We Talk Photo at Gmail. Any ideas for guests? It's going to be hard to top this one, <laughs> but any ideas, let us know. And um, until next time, we thank Andy for being here and we'll see you thank soon. Thank you for having me. All right, bye bye.